Today, we still get more than 75% of the global energy supply from fossil fuels, while we only get 1% from wind and solar. Now, we all know that we need to stop using these fossil fuels because they create pollution and CO2 problems. But how? How are we going to do that? In my country, we have been building wind power for more than 40 years now, essentially all my life. And we're still only able to supply a fraction of the, in, the country's total energy supply from wind. Fossil fuels also create other problems with wars and conflicts around the world. And that results in migration and refugees and hardship for a lot of people who didn't get a lot of benefit from those fossil fuels in the first place. But I believe that it's the responsibility of our generation to find a solution to this transition from fossil fuels to something else. And it's not going to be the global energy companies that are going to help us do that. And I don't think the politicians are going to do that for us, at least not on their own. It's not going to be the guy on the street in Bangladesh or somewhere that's going to solve the problems. It's us. It's people in the rich part of the world. It's people like you and me and people in other rooms like this that are going to solve this problem. And I have a great confidence that we can find a way to solve it. And one of the reasons is I read an article on the internet five years ago where it said a ball this size made out of thorium can supply you with all the energy you need for your entire life. And there's enough thorium on this planet to power the entire humanity with energy, plenty of energy, for more than a thousand years. And then it said in that article that thorium costs next to nothing. And I had to admit, when I read that, I didn't believe it for one second. So I just put it away and I went on with my life. But I'm the kind of guy who reads a lot of tech news. And these stories about molten salt reactors and thorium energy kept on popping up in those tech news streams. And I read a few more of those and I was curious. And then I said to myself, hey, I'm an engineer. And engineers are supposed to go home and calculate if it's really true all the things that we've been told in the media. So I did. And uh, thorium is an element in the periodic table. It was easy to find all the numbers that I needed for my calculation on Wikipedia. And in less than 15 minutes, I was able to calculate and get the result. And it's true. I was stunned in a big way when I found out. It's really true. There's all the energy that I need for my entire life in this ball. Not just for electricity, but for everything for heating my house and cooking my food, and for building roads and schools and houses and hospitals, and to manufacture all the products and goods that I need throughout my entire life, and transportation, everything, for a hundred years in this ball. That fascinated me more than just a little bit. I thought, this is super cool. I want to get me one of those balls. So I went on the internet and I googled, where, where can I buy one of these? But I couldn't. It turns out that thorium is slightly radioactive, so there are some rules and regulations. But more importantly, we're not using thorium anywhere in the industry today. That means there's no demand for thorium. That means there's no supply, and there's no market, and no market price. But through that research, I did find out that it's true that there's lots of thorium in this world for many thousand years. And when we mine for other materials that we need for high-tech products and electronics, we get lots of thorium out of the ground in those mining operations. But because there is no demand for it, the mining companies, they don't want to refine it, so they just put it back in the ground. But we have been using thorium a little bit in the past, and we know how to refine it, and it's actually an easy and very simple process, not very expensive. And that means that if we were to mine thorium, at an industrial scale, then a ball this size would cost you less than $100.
Ladies and gentlemen, that is less than one dollar per year for your entire energy supply. Think about that next time you go to the gas station and fill up your car. Of course, I, I also thought about that, and it's like, this seems really great. So we have all this energy in this ball, but why are we not using it? What's the problem? What am I not being told? And then I find out, ah, of course, it's because we need a machine to convert thorium into energy. And that machine is probably super duper difficult to make. It's probably something that the scientists have been spending billions of dollars and decades of research, and they have no idea how to make it work. But around that time, I also found out that there's, there was a small group of scientists back in the 60s at Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee in the United States. And they built a machine that they called a molten salt reactor. They had a very limited budget, and it took them a few years to build the machine. And then when they turned it on, it worked right away. And they ran it for five years. Woo! <laughs> now, that machine wasn't able to convert thorium into energy. But the scientists knew that if they could make this machine work, then they could build the next version, and the next version was highly likely able to work, and it would convert thorium into energy. But then the government at the time, and the president, this was Nixon at that time, he had promised some people in California that he, he wanted to create jobs over there. And they, that government, they didn't really understand this project of this new technology in Tennessee, so they decided to shut it down and spend some of those money in jobs in California. And then through some really unfortunate circumstances, this technology didn't get to the public's attention for almost 50 years. Until a guy called Kirk Sorensen heard about it, and he, then he started to dig into this. And he found out about it, and he started to publish some of these papers that the scientists had written in the 60s on the internet. And then people started to realize, holy cow, this is like the holy grail of energy production. And we've been sitting on top of it for all this time. And then word started to spread around the world, and, and people got involved, and that's, of course, also how I got involved. Now, these molten salt reactors is really the key here. So I want to tell you a little bit more about them. First of all, it's a nuclear reactor. But it's very, very different from the old type of nuclear reactors that we have in old power plants today, old nu nuclear power plants. I want to just quickly go through how they are different. Well, first of all, the old power plants, they are, of course, really big buildings. And it takes many years to build, and they're very expensive. I think you all know that. And then they rely on uh, electrical systems and humans and control rooms with lots of dials and buttons to make sure that they run safely. Um, and then finally, when we put uranium into them and burn that uranium, those old type of reactors are only capable of burning a few percent of that fuel. So what we get out of the reactor we call spent nuclear fuel, and it's radioactive and needs to be stored safely for 100,000 years or more. And that has caused a lot of headache in those countries who rely on nuclear energy today. But let's try to compare that to molten salt reactors. Those reactors are, can be built really small, and they can be built on, on an assembly line, just like we build cars and airplanes. And when we do that, we can get the price to come down and the quality to go up over time. And once we get into volume production, these molten salt reactors can be built at a very, very different price point than old type of nuclear power. You know, very small price. And then, with regards to the safety, molten salt reactors is known to be one of the safest reactor types that we know of. Uh, and I, I want to point out two things. There's one safety um, theme called walk-away safety, and it simply means that if all the human operators were to walk away from a, a reactor that is running, and we lose the control systems or the electricity, then these reactor types are still capable of shutting themselves down and come to a stop for using simple physical and mechanical properties and 
when they stop, they don't release any harmful materials to the surroundings. The other principle is called the prime minister safety. And it simply means that no matter how many stars you have on your shoulders, you will not be able to operate these reactors in a way where they become dangerous or unsafe. Even better, if somebody tries to fiddle with the reactor in ways that they shouldn't, then these reactors are capable of letting the world know about it before things get out of hand. But what really got me hooked is feature number four about the waste. Because these molten salt reactors are capable of burning all the fuel that we put into them. That means if I put this ball of thorium into that reactor and burn it, then I, what I get out is a, is a ball the same size of waste, and a tiny fraction of that is radioactive. And it needs to be stored safely for 300 years. But we already know how to store something very safe for 300 years. So essentially, all the headaches have been cleared up. But what's really great is that we can take the spent nuclear fuel from these old type of reactors and bring it over here. And then we can mix it with the thorium. And then we can burn it one more time and get additional energy out of it. But also really importantly, when we burn it the second time in the molten salt reactors, we reduce the number of years that the waste have to be stored also to 300 years. So let me just... Uh, now, so when I heard about all of this, I decided this is really great. What, you know, why are we not using it? And I decided I could not just sit around and wait for this to happen. I had to get involved. So I started to travel the world to go to conferences about thorium energy and molten salt reactors and build an international network of scientists and engineers that I could work with. And then in, here in Copenhagen, I was also able to meet with some really great scientists and engineers, and we formed a group, and eventually we decided to start a company together. And that, call, uh, that company is called Copenhagen Atomics. 